What's going on class? My name is Anthony Pegg, and my presentation is going to be on the history of cameras. Cameras have changed a lot over the years from the old Bellows camera by Kodak in 1910, I believe this model is, to the more contemporary Canon model, which you see here and we're a bit more familiar with. Now before the camera, in 1100 BC, they would use a device called the Camera Obscura, which would actually be a room built and insulated to be lightproof except for a tiny pinhole on one wall. And on the other wall, the light would come through, be projected and flipped, and the image of the outside world would now be on the wall. And then all it would take would be an artist's steady hand to come through and trace whatever your image would be, whether that be, uh, you know, some flowers or a landscape, they would make your image that way. Now, as you can imagine, the quality of your photograph now is in the hands of how talented your artist was. So if you had a bad artist, you might have a very low grade photo. This was an issue. Fast forward a couple hundred years until the 1800s, and there was a gentleman named Joseph Niesfor Niepce. Joseph Niepce was a chemist and had actually heard about a chemist before him by the name of Johann Heinrich Schultz. And what he did is he would actually take a glass water bottle, fill it full of a silver chloride solution, and then place a stencil around the water bottle. And what would happen is the silver chloride that was exposed to light would react and change a darker color. So when he would remove the stencil, there would be an image left. Granted, he didn't use this for any photography purposes and mainly use it for bar bets and playing tricks with his friends. This was huge and he didn't know it. So Niepce remembered hearing about Schultz's discovery of the silver chloride solution and a light bulb went off. What he did was took a piece of paper coated it in the same silver chloride solution and took a translucent piece of art, placed it over the silver chloride paper and exposed it to light, thus copying the image. Now let's fast forward until 1826. Joseph Niepce took it one step further and actually built his own camera obscura, the Lightroom, but he built it about the size of a little box, coated another piece of paper in the silver chloride solution, put the piece of paper inside of the camera obscura and set it next to his window at his farmhouse and let it sit there for eight hours. To his amazement, he had actually created an image. He had recorded reality for the first time to date. This picture is called the view from the window at La Grasse in 1826 and is known to be the very first photograph. Now, later this year, Niepce actually received a letter that was quite alarming. It was from a fellow named Luis de Guerre, and he mentioned he had actually heard about Niepce's experiments with recording reality. And needless to say, Niepce was alarmed that somebody had heard of his invention. De Guerre actually owned a museum in Paris and was very well known there. What he would do is he had a very large camera obscura built and would create landscapes and trace them on the walls in this museum. But the gentleman who sold Deguerre his camera lenses was the same camera lens optometrist that Niepce bought his camera lenses for, and he's the one that passed the word along to Deguerre. In Deguerre's letter, he let Niepce know that he too was working towards a way to try to record reality, and asked if he had any insight details he could share with him. Of course, Niepce was very gracious and flattered by the letter. He simply said thank you and didn't reveal any of his secrets. Probably a good idea if you're an inventor. A few more years went by and the two didn't work together but still would write each other and communicate off and on. And in 1829, Joseph Niesford Niepce had actually recorded an image in his camera from the same silver chloride solution. The image wasn't great but he was very excited and wrote to Gear about his discoveries. Because the image wasn't perfect and Gear saw that there was money in this, big money as a matter of fact, he told him to hold off on announcing this to the public and they too could work together to perfect this image and maybe make much more money together. After long consideration, Nieps agreed. For the next four years, the two would work in separate parts of the country um, and not really make any breakthroughs. And then in 1833, Nieps unfortunately died of a stroke. Deguerre was left with all of his notebooks, with all of his research, and Isidore, Niepce's son, was simply left with the debt from his father. 
But Isidore also had an interest for creating a photograph and wanted to continue his research with Daguerre. A few years then went by and Daguerre finally contacted Isidore with a breakthrough. What Daguerre's idea was is he actually took Niepce's original idea, coated a plate in silver chloride, and rather than letting the plate sit in the camera for eight hours, he instantly removed the plate after it exposed to light and heated it over mercury vapor. This then revealed the image and it stayed for much longer. There was still one issue. Once this photo was exposed to more light over time, it would fade and wouldn't be permanent. So, there was still a lot of work to be done. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, in England, there's actually a gentleman by the name of William Henry Fox Talbot, and he, little to their knowledge, was working on the same thing. Talbot was actually on his honeymoon at the time and was attempting to trace images of the landscape that he saw on paper using a similar device as the camera obscura. Almost instantly, Talbot realized these images weren't very good and realized there must be a way to fix an image of reality. Now Talbot actually had a background in chemistry and was able to come across a solution rather quick. So what Talbot did is he actually coated a piece of paper in a salt solution that he came up with and put a stencil over top and exposed it to light. Where the light was hitting the paper, it would become dark and where the stencil was, it would remain light. This created the first photo negative. So being the intelligent man that Talbot was, once he had his photo negative, he simply coated another piece of paper in the salt solution put the photo negative in front of that, and then expose that to light, and then it just flipped it back. Now we have a positive. The funny thing is, Talbot didn't take it any further than that. He didn't publish his findings. He simply said, oh, that's pretty cool. I got other stuff to work on. I'm gonna set that back there. I gotta figure it out. He had no idea that just across the English Channel, there was Daguerre and Niepce, who had recently passed, who had been working on this for over 15 years at this point. Now, after Talbot set this invention aside, because again, he didn't know anyone else was working on it, Daguerre made a huge discovery in 1837. He used the same methods as before, but this time, when he took the image out of the camera, he would instantly soak it in a salt water solution. This solidified the image and would cause no fading once it was processed. He called up Niepce's son Isidore once again, told him about his discovery, and was going to publish it. This is where Isidore gets a little upset. Louis Daguerre named this process the Daguerreotype. Not the Niepce Daguerreotype, simply the Daguerreotype. And Isidore was pretty mad. His dad had worked for over 13 years before he died trying to come up with this invention. Daguerre simply inherited his father's notebooks and got all the credit. So because Daguerre felt bad, he did sign another contract with Niepce's son Isidore to grant him some royalties in case any money was made, which it was. Once Daguerre announced his invention to the French Academy, they went wild. They granted him 7,000 francs and 5,000 francs to Isidore. For about 20 more years into the late 1890s, people were using the calotypes and daguerreotypes. The issue was they were very bulky, often 15 pounds of equipment you'd have to lug around, and many chemicals. Most photographers actually became very ill or deranged from simply inhaling all of these. This is until one man came along, Mr. George Eastman. Eastman had started photography as a hobby in the late 1870s, but like many photographers, dreamed of a way that he didn't have to lug around all this equipment and inhale all the stinky fumes. Maybe some kind of an invention, um, a film, if you will. Some of you may be ahead of me, and you're on the right track. What Eastman did is he developed a machine that would actually smear a gelatin emulsion that he came up with onto the plate that he would place in the back of his calotype or daguerreotype cameras that he was using, and then this would preserve an image that could be brought out later by one chemical solution rather than 10. And because it worked so well, he wanted a way to make something a little more easy than a plate. Maybe something that's more flexible. That's where he came up with the idea of film as we know it. 
George Eastman knew this film discovery would be huge, and he decided he wanted to make a camera company. He was pondering names and wanted something that would remind people of a camera when they heard the name. And that's where he came up with the idea of something that reminded him of the sound of a camera shutter. And it actually became Kodak. It was two syllables and he said it would remind everyone of the sound of a camera when they heard it. So Kodak was invented. But because cameras up until this point were kind of a difficult process to learn how to use, and a more difficult process learning how to develop the photos, he wanted everyone to have a chance at taking photos. So he developed a slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. Where you would simply take your camera, take all your pictures, and then for $15, you could drop your camera off, they would develop the photos, and bring them to your door. With a new roll of film in your camera. This instantly took off and they sold 5 million cameras in their first year of operation. Now because of his invention of film and the creation of the company Kodak, Eastman was wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. It's a sad ending for Mr. Eastman as on his 78th birthday he had some friends come over, they had dinner, a long night of drinking, and once they left he went back up into his room. About an hour later his housekeeper said she heard a gunshot <laughs> She went to see what the sound was, and she had come to find that Eastman actually took his own life. The father of modern day photography ended it all with a note simply saying, My work here is done. Why wait? So I hoped you liked learning a little bit of the history about how cameras started from the camera obscura and actually developed into what we have similar here as the bellows camera that were able to record an image on film thanks to George Eastman. Thank you guys.